Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream, part two. Hopefully, the video will work this time. I'll be waiting for everybody to pop in and tell me, yes, it's working, or no, it's not. We had a little bit of trouble earlier in the evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, a mom of five. It was a shocking disappearance, a brutal murder with financial motor motives, betrayal, and all sorts of crazy facts, and it's about to go to trial. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. It, there are so many facts you won't believe. There are bloody seats, trash bags full of bloody clothes dumped all over Hartford, Connecticut in various trash bins. There was an attempt, perhaps, to frame a loyal employee and literally the kitchen sink. It's a horrifying case. It's resulted in two deaths and left five children as orphans. It could be a dark crime novel, but it's not. It's real life, and it really happened in Connecticut. And now the trial of Michelle Tracona starts on Thursday, and we will finally get some insight into what happened. The trial is going to be televised on Court TV. I'd encourage you to follow it during the day there. At night, we're going to be talking about what's happened in the trial, going live about that. Tonight, my goal is to introduce the case to you. Then on Wednesday, we're going to go through the arrest warrant affidavit. And so by then, you will be ready to go for the trial. And throughout the trial then at night, I'm going to be recapping what happened. I don't know for sure. There's a lot of medical stuff going on in my family, so I can't say for sure. Are we going live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday only? Or will we be going live on Tuesday and Thursday too? If possible, I want to go every night. We'll just see. There are two free things you could do right at the outset here that would help the channel. First thing is subscribe. And we would love to have you back. And this case is going to be absolutely fascinating. The second thing is if you would just hit the like button, something easy to do, but it will really help with the video. And I'd appreciate it. Especially important tonight since we are now on round two. So we'll be down on our number of views. So if you could hit the like button, it will really help. So let's talk about this case. This is Jennifer Dulos. She dropped, and it was May 24th, 2019. She dropped her five kids off at school in New Canaan, Connecticut. She was going through a contentious divorce from her husband, Fotis Dulos. The divorce and custody battle had dragged on for two years, and the Duloses lived separately. The kids lived with Jennifer, and so the daily tasks of being a mom fell on her. Jennifer had her master's degree in writing from New York University Tisch School of the Arts. She wrote for Patch.com. She had her own blog. Her soon-to-be ex-husband, Fotis Dulos, was born in Turkey and grew up in Greece. He had an MBA from Columbia Business School. Jennifer and Fotis had met in college at Brown. Fotis married someone else after college, but that marriage only lasted four years. A month after his divorce finalized, Fotis and Jennifer married on August 28, 2004. The couple moved to Farmington, Connecticut, where Fotis ran an extremely successful real estate company that specialized in luxury homes. And let me flip over and show you Fotis. This is Fotis. And I could easily be saying these names wrong. I ought to be able to get it right as the trial gets started. But for now, I'm doing the best I can. He, but the couple had their differences. And after 13 years of marriage, Jennifer filed for divorce on June 20th, 2017. Now, she moved and rented an absolutely lovely, something like $3.8 million home. And here it is uh, for you to see. Oh, yep, there we go. Uh, so uh, for the kids and for her, and it was south of Farmington, Fotis had an even nicer, more gorgeous home that was uh, up there in Farmington and was worth over $5 million. The Duloses had five kids. And by 2019, which is the year that Jennifer disappeared, the kids ranged in ages from eight to 13. Now there were many signs that Jennifer was afraid of her husband, Fotis. She wrote in the divorce documents that 
I know that filing for divorce and filing this motion will enrage him. I know he will retaliate by trying to harm me in some way. Now, Jennifer also alleged that she thought her husband was having an affair with a work colleague, Michelle Traconis. She's a defendant in the trial that's about to happen on Thursday. Jennifer claimed that her husband, Fotis, even went so far as to threaten to kidnap the children unless she agreed to his divorce terms. She mentioned the fact that he had bought a gun earlier in the year. Now, Fotis denied all of this. He denied even threatening Jennifer, said he bought the gun just for home security. Now, the divorce grew steadily more bitter as it dragged into the second year. By this time, Michelle Traconis, and um, yep, making sure that everything is still right on the screen. By this time, Michelle Traconis was clearly Fotis's girlfriend and was living with him with her own 10-year-old daughter. Now, at first, Jennifer and Fotis, and I'm going to pull this out so I can talk to you a little bit more directly. Okay. At first, Jennifer and Fotis Dulos shared custody of their five children, but that arrangement was really uneasy. Both Jennifer and Fotis claimed that the other was disparaging them to the kids. Things changed in early 2018 when the court concluded that Fotis had violated court orders not to have the children around any new romantic partners. Now, court documents show that Fotis had let the children be around Michelle Traconis, his new girlfriend. And since letting the kids be around her was a violation of the court order, Fotis also allegedly asked his oldest sons to lie about it when they met with the court-appointed psychologist. Because Fotis had violated the court's rules and done this, the court awarded sole physical custody to Jennifer. Not only did Fotis lose joint custody, he also was relegated to supervised visitation, which had to have been a mighty blow given what a difference it was. The bitterness extended not just to Jennifer and Fotis, but to Jennifer's family as well. In February 2018, while the divorce was pending, Jennifer's mother sued Fotis over what she said was a $1.7 million loan that Fotis had never repaid. Jennifer's mother was not the only person who was worried about Fotis's solvency. Law enforcement would put together a financial picture that showed Fotis was in an overwhelming amount of debt, and we'll go over that evidence more on Wednesday. Now, May 24, 2019 started like any other day. Jennifer dropped her kids off at school around 8 a.m. A neighbor's security camera showed that she returned home at 8.05 a.m. A totally normal, ordinary, everyday morning, but that was the last anyone ever saw of Jennifer Dulos. She had an appointment at 11, and she missed it. And another appointment at 1, and she missed that one too. At 10.25 a.m., the neighbor's security camera showed Jennifer Chevrolet Suburban leaving her house. Now, police believe that Fotis was driving the Suburban and that Jennifer's body and cleaning supplies were in the back. At 11.30 a.m., Jennifer's nanny, Lauren Alameda, arrived at the house. She noticed that Jennifer's Land Rover was still in the garage and her Suburban was missing. That was odd because Jennifer had planned to take the Land Rover to her doctor's appointments that day. Lauren waited and then Lauren and the kids waited, but Jennifer never showed up all that day. She never came back from the doctor's appointments, never came bursting in to greet the kids. By 7 p.m., the nanny and two of Jennifer's friends reported that Jennifer was missing and that it was completely out of character for her to not show up for her children. She was a devoted mom, and it just didn't make sense. Something was clearly wrong. Police went to Jennifer's house, and they made a horrifying discovery. They found blood spatter on the floor, door, and wall in the garage, the exterior of the Land Rover that was still sitting in the garage had blood spatter on it. DNA testing would later confirm that the blood belonged to Jennifer. And most importantly of all, police discovered that the kitchen faucet had blood on it. DNA testing would confirm that the blood was Jennifer's, 
but there was also male DNA on the faucet. DNA testing would show it was Fotis's blood, which caused law enforcement to wonder, did he get Jennifer's blood on him during the murder and try to wash it off at the kitchen sink? This kitchen sink evidence will be extremely important because supposedly Fotis had never been in Jennifer's new house, ever. Meanwhile, while the police were searching Jennifer's house at 7.30 p.m., Fotis and Traconis were 10 miles east of Jennifer's home, riding through the streets of Hartford, Connecticut. They were driving a red, they were driving a pickup truck registered to Fotis's company. And let me show you um, a picture of the of what they were doing. I'm going to show you the red pickup truck, which I'll explain in just a minute. I have it slightly out of order. And you'll see here they are with um, with the trash bags. Now, police put together video from various sources within Hartford. They saw Fotis getting out of the truck over and over again, appearing to dump, to dump garbage bags in trash bins around the city. Not just one, but several. 31, they thought, perhaps. Cell phone evidence corroborates that Fotis was in Hartford at this time. Police traced that route, the route that Fotis and Traconis had taken, looking for the trash bags, and they found some shocking evidence. They found trash bags filled with bloody clothing and blood-stained cleaning supplies, and DNA testing would confirm that the blood belonged to Jennifer, which made the evidence even more damning. And inside one of the trash bags, law enforcement found a glove that had Fotis's DNA on the inside. One of the trash bags had Michelle Traconis's and Jennifer Dulos's DNA, and another had Jennifer's, Michelle's, and Fotis's, Fotis's DNA. Let me show you another picture of Fotis. Meanwhile, law enforcement located Jennifer's missing suburban three miles from her house on the side of a road in New Haven, Connecticut. Sorry, New Canaan, Connecticut. Police began the very grim search for Jennifer's body, and they pulled out all the stops. They searched numerous properties that Fotis's company owned. They used divers. They brought in canines. They even looked from helicopters. But to this day, no one has ever found Jennifer's body. And as always, a murder case without a dead body is more difficult to prosecute. But in this case, it's also true that Jennifer Dulos never appeared again, that she never contacted her family, most especially her five children, never accessed her own money. And authorities feel it is more than safe to say that she's dead. And so they charge Fotis Dulos. Let me make this a little bit, use a little bit different format. Now, it doesn't take a PhD in criminology to figure out that Fotis Dulos was a pretty obvious suspect, right? He's the estranged husband. He's in the middle of a nasty custody dispute. It was obvious that the police would at least consider whether he could have committed the crime. Here's what police think happened. They found bicycle tire marks near Jennifer's home. And their theory is that Fotis went to Jennifer's home on his bike and waited until she drove the kids to school. He lay in wait for her. She drove back with no idea of the hell that was in store for her. They believed that she pulled into the garage where Fotis was waiting, or maybe ran in. Maybe he ran in after her when she opened the garage door. In any event, they believed that Fotis killed her and left behind the brutal, bloody scene. Now, from the get go, Fotis was unhelpful, and that would be to say the least. He, as police looked for Jennifer, he showed up three hours late for his initial police interview. And then the only thing that happened was that Fotis's attorney announced that Fotis would not be answering any questions for the police. Now, over the objections of Fotis's attorney, police at least seized his phone and put it in airplane mode until they could get a warrant. You may remember that failing to put the phone in airplane mode created a bunch of trouble in Murdoch's case, but they did do it in this case. Now, it took some time for police to piece together the evidence to be sure they had a case. They arrested Fotis and Traconis pretty quickly in June 2019, but they only charged them at that point with tampering with evidence and with hindering prosecution. Now, let's go ahead. I'm 
moving back and forth here to get you a new document up. Okay, so this is sort of a diagram of the people that we're going to be talking about. Yep, you can see it. Okay, so Jennifer Dulos is the person missing, the mom of five believed murdered. Fotis Dulos, her husband, was arrested. We're going to talk more about where he is now. Kent Mawinney was his attorney, but is accused of involvement in this as part of the conspiracy. And Michelle Traconis, Fotis's new girlfriend, is also accused of conspiracy. Now, let's talk about Mawinney. And again, I may be saying that wrong. That's my best guess. So Kent Mawinney, in a, in a surprise twist, law enforcement charged Fotis's friend and former attorney, Kent Mawinney, with conspiracy to commit murder. On October 19, 2020, he was released on bond of $246,000. Now, Michelle Traconis says that Mawinney had been at Fotis's house the morning that Jennifer disappeared. She initially said Mawinney and Fotis were meeting together, but later she agreed that Fotis was not actually at the house, just Mawinney was. Now, according to cell phone records, Fotis called Mawinney while he was driving around Hartford throwing out those bloody trash bags. Police asked Mawinney what they talked about, but rather conveniently, he said that the day after the call, he fell down the stairs, the fall gave him a concussion and broke his phone, which he then had to replace. Mawinney and his wife were in the midst of a contentious divorce just like the Duloses. Mawinney's wife accused him of spousal rape. She also told the South Windsor police that she thought Fotis and Mawinney were working together to kill her. And then there were two deeply disturbing additional allegations. Mawinney's wife told detectives that for some confusing reason, Dulos took a sudden interest in helping the Mawinnies reconcile. He met with Mawinnie's wife at a restaurant and then tried to get her to meet him again, but this time at his house, but she refused to do that. There was an even more unsettling matter related to Mawinnie. Mawinnie had founded the Windsor Rod and Gun Club. He had left the club, but in March, two months before Jennifer Dulos disappeared in May, he asked to get back on the property. His phone was tracked near the club on March 29th. Then on May 18th, six days before Jennifer Dulos disappeared, two men who were hunting on the property found a six foot long hole covered by grill grates. 100% a human grave, one of them would say later. In the grave were two unopened bags of lime in a blue tarp. Four days later, the bags of lime were gone. A little over a month later, the grave had been filled in. After Jennifer Dulos disappeared, the two men who had stumbled on the hole contacted law enforcement. Police went to the scene about a month after Jennifer disappeared on June 21st. But when the police dug, they found nothing. To make absolutely sure, police also brought in a canine team on August 14th but the canines did not find anything either. Then the case took another strange and shocking turn in late January, 2020. Now on the 8th of January, Fotis's bond was set at 6 million and he met it and was released the next day. On January 28th, Fotis was due in court for an emergency bond hearing. According to his new girlfriend, new girlfriend, Anna Curry, he told her to drive on, to drive separately. He would meet her there. While she was on the way, Fotis's lawyer called and asked Anna why Fotis had not shown up at the courthouse. Anna Curry realized Fotis might be trying to harm himself and told the lawyer to call 911 and get someone to the house immediately. Police went to Fotis's house and let me show you an actual uh, that's, oh, that's Kent Mawinney. If I hadn't shown you that before, Michelle Traconis, wait, where's my, oh no, they have, there's an actual photograph of them. There, there's video of the attempt to, I, I'm just going to go ahead and remove this and just talk to you all the rest of the time. There's actual footage of the first responders trying to help him and performing CPR on photos. So they found him unresponsive, and a note next to his body said, 
I refused to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing, all caps, to do with. Now, responders were able to get a faint heartbeat after CPR, and and but you know it was too late. And two days later, doctors removed Fotis from life support and declared him dead. Now, there's another key character in this drama, but not someone the police suspect was involved with the murder. Fotis had a loyal and long-term employee, Pablo Jimiani. Normally, Jimiani drove the red company truck, but for some strange reason, Fotis insisted on driving Jimiani's truck on the day of the murder. And Fotis had a very short haircut at the time, not his normal haircut. He got a different haircut in, in those initial mudshot photos show that. Nancy Grace has argued that Fotis cut his hair short just before the murders in order to look more like Jimmy Inney and that he was trying to frame his longtime employee. After Jennifer disappeared, then Fotis returned the truck to Jimmy Inney and insistently demanded that Jimmy Inney take out the seats which looked perfectly fine to Jimmy Any and put in different ones. But why? It didn't make any sense. And Jimmy Any remembered clearly that this had happened and let the police know after Jennifer's disappearance. Now, although we've been talking mostly about Fotis Dulos, the husband of Jennifer, he's not on trial. <laughs> and the reason for that is, of course, he's not available to be on trial because of what he did to himself. The trial we're going to be covering is the trial of Michelle Traconis. In the arrest warrant affidavit, the police identified several key pieces of evidence that they believe link Michelle Traconis to a conspiracy to murder Jennifer Dulos. Michelle was, first of all, Michelle was with Fotis when he dumped those blood-soaked trash bags containing Jennifer's DNA in various bins around Hartford. Now, we'll say in fairness, in the videos, it seems that it's Fotis who's actually throwing out the trash bags. Now, Michelle's DNA was also found on the plastic garbage bags that Fotis threw out. While Traconis was driving around Hartford with Fotis, Fotis also threw out not just those trash bags, but a pair of license plates. The license plates had been doctored using duct tape so that they looked like they had different numbers than what they really had. The prosecution also found what they're calling the alibi script in the home where Fotis and Michelle were living. Now, that script was written in both Fotis's and Traconis's handwriting, and it was a detailed, minute, hour-by-hour -hour description of what they had done on the day of the murder. The state says Traconis followed this as the script in her first interview, but that she had to give it up in her second and then her third interview as the state proved items were not possible, were incorrect or false. Now, the state believes all of those differences in the interviews shows that Michelle was intentionally trying to mislead the police and intentionally trying to cover up Fotis's crime. Michelle Traconis is from Venezuela, and she, has, she is using an interpreter during pretrial hearings her attorneys are going to argue that some of the incriminating statements she made during the trial were due to the language barrier and not actually admissions. Now, during some of the pretrial hearings, there were some rulings on important evidence as to whether it's going to come in. Michelle Traconis was interviewed by the police three times. She wanted to suppress the interviews. That means she wanted to keep the state from introducing them. Michelle's lawyers say that they believed the police had lied to Traconis about what evidence they had, that they had misled her about what she had said the day before. But the court has said those interviews can come into evidence. And the state believes they're powerful evidence. The state believes that Michelle Traconis contradicted herself numerous times during those interviews and that it's going to help the state with its case. And Michelle wanted them out, so the chances are the state is correct. Michelle, the state did win on that issue, and Michelle didn't want it in, but it will be in. Now, the Michelle's lawyers won, though, on a very big issue. The court ruled that the state can't use her cell phone evidence as evidence against her because they didn't have a warrant when they seized it from her. They had a warrant to search Dulos's home where she lived and to get DNA from her, but the warrant did not authorize them to take the phone itself. 
Jury selection was very unusual in this case. They did jury selection last fall. By October, it was completed, which is really unusual. I don't, I've never heard of anybody doing that before. And it, it could lead to some obvious problems. First of all, everybody knows who the jurors will be, even if they don't have their names, they've seen them. And then secondly, it led to some problems here where a juror or more than one, it's unknown exactly, but had to get off and had to get off because of of things that could have happened in the last few months. Maybe they got a new job, maybe they moved, maybe someone in the family got sick. So as a result, they're having to replace some of those jurors in time for, they were supposed to start uh, on today, on Monday, and they're not now not going to start the trial until Thursday while they're working on that. So, um, so I'm going to take a quick look over in the, uh, in the chat and see if there are any questions that I have. We're pretty, looks like I don't see any questions. So perfect. Well, we will finish up on this case on Wednesday. I'm going to go through the affidavit that was filed with the arrest application. And that gives us a really detailed roadmap of what evidence they're going to produce at trial. Now, this is going to be broadcast starting on Thursday. And that is going to make a significant it's going to take us several weeks. We're going to be covering that. I think it's going to be a really interesting trial. I think we'll learn a lot and cover it. I look forward to doing it with y'all. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button because you don't want to miss covering the case. Also, if you would hit the like button, it's especially important since we ended up with a little bit of technical trouble and had to go at a different time. It's a smaller crowd. So I would really appreciate your hitting the like button. That will really help. And I will see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m.